Good evening, my dear friends, and welcome to our Friday night soiree, a time of reflection, a time of stillness, and a time of reawakening the divine already within us. I would like to begin by inviting you to light a candle for global peace and for our beautiful sacred earth. So let us be still as we light our lights together and release that light out into the world. In the name of our beloved Father, Mother, God Supreme, who creates life, in the name of the risen cosmic Christ, who loves life, in the name of the Spirit, who is the fire of life. In the name of Gaia, our beloved Earth Mother, who nurtures the divine in all life. In the name of all faith traditions and none, for they are the children of God, our brothers and sisters. And in the name of spiritual diversity, on behalf of our community, the brothers and sisters of the Teo community of St. Francis, I welcome you to this table of love. <clears throat> and first I would like to read to you from the late John O'Donoghue's beautiful book to bless this space between us. And he says this, there is a quiet light that shines every heart. It draws no attention to itself, though it is always secretly there. It is what illuminates our minds to see beauty, our desire to seek possibility, and our hearts to love life itself. Without this subtle quickening, our days would be empty and wearisome, and no horizon would ever awaken our longing. So just relax, my dear friends, and enjoy what I share with your heart. A Pilgrim's Way, Part 7, The New Celtic Monasticism for Everyday People. Our section this evening focuses on contemplative prayer. The terms contemplation and meditation are used in opposite ways by different groups. In contrast to Buddhists, for example, we mean by contemplation a gazing upon or being with God, a disposition of the heart that does not use the mind or the mouth. We mean by meditation the use of the mind to think about the meaning of a scripture theme or picture. For God alone my soul waits in stillness, writes the psalmist. Contemplation is the heart's disposition towards its divine lover. It is nurtured in silence, though it can continue in the presence of activity. John Cassian <clears throat> wrote of the contemplative prayer of the fourth century desert Christians. The soul bathed in light from on high no longer uses human speech, which is always inadequate. Like an overabundant spring, 
all feelings overflow and spring forth towards God at the same time. In this short moment, it says so many things that the soul, once it has recovered itself, could neither express nor go over them in its memory. Brother Lawrence, a simple 17th century Carmelite monk who is famed for his meditation on how to practice the presence of God in the kitchen, wrote, My commonest attitude is this simple attentiveness and habitual loving turning of my eyes to God to whom I often found myself bound with more happiness and gratification than a babe enjoys clinging to its nurse's breast. So if I dare use the expression, I should be glad to describe this condition as the breasts of God. Contemplative prayer flourished in the early Celtic churches. The anonymous Lindisfarne monk who wrote about Cuthbert's busy time at Lindisfarne observes, Cuthbert dwelt also according to Holy Scripture, following the contemplative amid the active life. In old age, according to Bede, Cuthbert finally entered into the remoter solitude he had so long sought, thirsted after and prayed for. He was delighted that after a long and spotless active life he should be thought worthy to ascend to the stillness of divine contemplation. The unknown author of the English classic, The Cloud of Unknowing, writes that it is union with God as far as is possible in this mortal life, which is the objective of the contemplative work. The difference between organized and contemplative prayer can be likened to the making of a pond. The organized way is to carry or divert water with great effort from its source and pour it into the pond. The alternative is to locate the pond over a spring source. The first way of praying begins in our efforts and hopefully ends in God. It can bring great blessings, but can also be constricting and become something we cling to. The contemplative way begins in God and ends in us. Contemplation is the primary calling of some who follow this way. Solitude is the place they return to. They revolve around regular silent spaces. They need to be affirmed in this calling rather than pressed to do other things. Contemplatives need quiet places to repair to. Pustinias, prayer rooms, open air sanctuaries, retreat houses. Some, like Anna and Simeon, frequent churches. For others, their car becomes their portable cell. None of us, however, are without some contemplative element. And Alan P. Torrey writes, there is a contemplative in all of us, 
almost strangled but still alive, who craves quiet enjoyment of the now and longs to touch the seamless garment of silence which makes us whole. Isn't that a beautiful reflection? <clears throat> Excuse me. And regarding meditation, meditation joins us with others in the world who seek to live in purity, self-awareness, peace, joy, and unself-consciousness. Meditation fosters experiences in which we can feel one with nature, life, and the world. Silence and solitude keep us to see the big lie in our compulsive lives, that we will have more time, better health, more fulfilling work, close friends later. Praise comes from a Latin word meaning to prize or express appreciation. Praise of God should therefore be habitual. Hilda never ceased to publicly give thanks to her maker, even in adversity, and urged others to do the same. This we can do by chanting psalms, singing praise songs, or in tongues, composing poems of praise, rehearsing blessings, repeating a single word such as Alleluia, a phrase such as praise you. Another popular word is praise you Lord, or a hallowed refrain such as glory to the Father, glory to the Son, glory to the Holy Spirit, as it was, is now and shall be forever. This last was the refrain on the lips of Bede, the historian from whom we gain our knowledge of Aden and Hilda, that's Hilda of Whitby Abbey, as he died in his Jarrow Monastery on Ascension Day in the year 735. We use words that are natural to us today as well as those handed down to us and delight to sing a new song to God. In the Celtic tradition, Christ's presence at the heart of creation is habitually celebrated. There is a time for feasting as well as for fasting. Surely you can't make guests at a wedding party go without food as long as the bridegroom is with them. Jesus, who is the bridegroom, told us. The people of Israel gathered together three times a year to celebrate God's goodness in freeing them, the Passover, and sustaining them first and last harvests. See Exodus chapter 23, verses 14 to 19. Every seven years, they invited everyone, even alien workers, to celebrate and listen to God's law. We participate in similar national and local celebrations. When the Spirit came with power upon Jesus, first apostles, it seems that they saw this as part of a movement to restore the full range and depth of worship that flowered under King David. In this spirit, we seek to restore celebrations which use a wide range of musical instruments, 
prophetic words and creative actions. And regarding the rhythm of work, we welcome work as a gift from God. Every member should engage in work, whether it be the routine activities of life or paid employment. Work motivated by values which conflict with the way should be avoided as much as possible. In humility, we accept what God gives us. If we have no employment and are not clear what our work is, then we seek the advice of our soul friend. We seek not to overwork, standing firm against all pressure to do so, because it robs ourselves, others or God, of the time we should give to them. All human beings resemble God in certain ways. It is in our nature, like God's, to create. Work reflects our divine calling to have godly charge of all that is on earth and to transform it for good. Work is a blessing of creation, not a result of human sin. In the parable, Jesus expects every human being to be a good steward of the earth, their time and talents, for example, St. Paul taught that everyone who can should work and a worker should be given decent pay. He also advised that those who refuse to work should not be given free meals. Pope John Paul II, 1984, encyclical on human work, teaches that work is a God-given means of growth in the individual and in the community. God calls us to undertake work that is valid and to do it with all our heart as an offering to God. And in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 7 we read, in every work, sorry, work as if you were serving the Lord, not human beings. And in 2 Chronicles, in every work that he undertook, he did it with all his heart and prospered. And in Ecclesiastes, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. And in 1 Corinthians, do all your work in love. The way work is experienced often falls far short of these ideals. Many people regard financial profit as the only reason for work, which then becomes but a necessary evil. Jobs and workers are treated as objects to be moved around or dispensed with like pawns on a chessboard. When money is thought to be the only measure of a person's worth, those who can't find no paid employment think of themselves as out of work and can write themselves off as worthless. This can lead to a downward spiral and an addictive dependency. This was the Marxist criticism of capitalism, which called for workers to unite and overthrow their bosses. In Genesis, work, which in its origins was a blessing, becomes cursed as a result of humans disobeying their God. Thus, all humans, not just owners of capital, are responsible for combating the wrong things and fostering the good things in the world of work. Though those who receive the most 
should take the most responsibility. And movements which enshrine the rights of employed people have led to the creation of reasonable working conditions. And there we shall leave it for now and just focus now as we come to the Cathedral of God and relax and spend a little time just reawakening our heart to the divine spirit within and all around us. Let us just relax for a moment. Relax and be still. And in the stillness, let us allow our senses connect with Mother Earth, with nature. And as we breathe in, we breathe in the very breath of God. It is a healing love that transcends all negativity. And with each in-breath, it releases pure love throughout our mind, our body and our spirit. Come with me and sit in our monastery garden as we take shelter under the cherry blossom tree. It is safe there. There is shelter. And in front of us, there is a simple pond with fish and several little waterfalls cascading of water and the sound is relaxing. It soothes the mind and the weary heart. And all around us, we can hear chimes, wooden chimes, metal chimes, bells. There is a gentle breeze and the rays of brother sun allows us to sit back and embrace the divine within our being and all around us. Allow yourself this time to be still. to be whole, enfold, hold and listen to the inner voice of the divine speaking with your heart. And with every in-breath that you breathe, there is a healing love, <clears throat> a love that transports you to a place of beauty, a place of stillness. And you feel warm and comforted. And you become aware that all around you, nature is trying to connect with you. Sound through your gift of hearing, the fragrance of the many flowers and plants and herbs, through your sense of smell, the beauty of the structures, the formation of plants and trees, and the animal kingdom through your sense of sight. And the gentleness of the foliage to your sense of touch. And by your feet are the three monastery dogs, Clemmy, Winston and Poppy, nestling against your feet 
and you feel safe now. The three little helpers from nature have come to empower your heart. Let go of fear and transcend and transcend to a place of exquisite beauty for you are in the presence of God and God is all around you and standing before you is the cosmic Christ and you can sense his love for you And he comes to you and he sits next to you and with every in-breath that you breathe you are aware of his fragrance you are aware of his love and he reaches out his hand to hold you closer to him so that you will know in your deepest sorrow and sadness that you are a beloved of God, a child of God, and that nothing can harm you within this protection. For you are surrounded by a myriad of angels and archangels who comfort you, protect you. Just receive the gift of the Christ who has called you by your name. Come, receive my love and let that love penetrate those parts of you that are in fear, denial, maybe in sadness, and know that you are loved. Relax into that love, for there is no greater love than the love of your God. And you may feel inspired in your heart to recite a simple mantra, I am a child of God. I am loved because I am a child of God. Sense the peace of that love. Sense the strength flowing from that love. It's creating a sense of balance and harmony and divine connectedness within your soul. And all is well. And all is well. You are at one now within the very heart of God. And with every in-breath that you breathe, it is a liberating love, the love of your God. Be at peace in that love, for there is no greater love than to be in love with the divine. Surrender your helplessness to the cosmic Christ and let him lead you to paradise. Be still. Be still. And in 
that stillness. Receive the blessing of Christ as he anoints your mind.